the, the climate system is pretty sensitive, uh, uh, and, 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 and that, doesn't, that wouldn't matter if we hadn't constructed the modern world to be quite closely matched to the climate system that we inherited. So our food supplies, our water supplies, the way we transport ourselves, our heating systems, our cooling systems and so on, are pretty much tuned to the climate system that we inherited, which had been unusually stable for the last uh, you know, 10,000 years or so you know, through the Holocene. Um, so when people say, oh, well, just sit back, let's see what happens, because we can't predict it exactly, Let, let's wait and see how it pans out and then we'll adapt to it, well, all right, that means completely rebuilding probably major pieces of our, our global infrastructure upon which we rely, our life support apparatus. But of course, there's no guarantee that what we adapt to is stable. Um, it will probably veer off and do something else. We, we may be provoking the climate system so that it becomes much less stable than it's been during the Holocene. How could you adapt to that? Um, so so it's, it, when I say the climate system is, is sensitive, that's really the, the message that I'm trying to get across. And in fact, one thing I, I would like to point out, and it's a, a shame, I meant to point it out in, in my talk, but um, I got carried away. Sea level is rising at about 3.5, uh, 3.8 millimetres per year. That is one third of the rate that it was rising after the very rapid termination of the last ice age when massive ice sheets in the northern hemisphere were melting all around their periphery. It's just the remnants that are left now in Greenland and, uh, and a substantial ice sheet on Antarctica. And yet already in a hundred years we've gone from stable sea level to sea level which is rising at one third of the rate uh, of the change between the last glacial and interglacial. So that tells you the scale of the impact that we've already had. Our work at the Science Museum showed that uh, even people who self-selected to come to the Science Museum, so they're, they're people interested in, in science and engineering, um, although they recognise that climate change is a big issue, um, their actual knowledge of it was pretty hazy. Uh, and the more we delved into it, the more we exposed that the links um, between uh, the, the sort of evidence for greenhouse gases warming the planet, um, carbon emissions, and indeed then the technologies that might pave a way to a, a low carbon future, it barely existed at all. Uh, so that, that is something that the uh, uh, climate science community really needs to recognise and work on. They've been um, uh, happily assuming uh, what's called the information deficit model, that all they have to do is speak slowly and clearly and provide the evidence, everybody will get it and then human behaviour will change. And of course that's not the way humans behave at all. Humans react to evidence based on their, their world view. And if, the, if the, the new knowledge conflicts with uh, what they're comfortable with, if it's an unwelcome or inconvenient truth, um, then they will react against it. So first of all, the science community needs to understand the psychology of it better. But there's another problem. Um, if a scientist becomes an activist, and it's interesting that in that uh, second session today there was an assumption that that was the right thing to do to get the message across. If, if I as a scientist become an activist, then people have a right to begin to question whether I'm being truly impartial in the way that I assess evidence. This means that if I, uh, if I go out into the public in a, in a strongly activist position, I have to be careful, first of all, that I'm not fooling myself with the evidence that I present, but also I have to be able to convince people that I am being impartial, and I have to overcome the information deficit problem as well. The way that I believe that this can be done is to work with those parts of society, the dramatists, the playwrights, the, the, the writers, the artists, who have a recognised role in society to provoke and change people's minds, to change people's attitudes, to get people to think outside the box. The role of the scientist then is very straightforward, to ensure that the material that's presented, the narrative that's presented, is rigorous, robust, defensible and true. The, the problem for policy makers is that they need uh, first of all, they prefer black and white, clear information, uh, all the information they need to make their decisions, you know, how high to build sea defences, you know, where to uh, source grain from and so on. The science community is never going to be able to provide that level of detail. And, and indeed, if you, if you focus on the uncertainty, then that is a way of bogging down and doing nothing. And indeed, people ask me, you know, how can I tell whether somebody is, is trying to twist this debate? Um, and I say to them, are they emphasising uncertainty or are they emphasising risk? If they're emphasising uncertainty, either deliberately or inadvertently, 
they are leading you into a position of paralysis because with uncertainty comes you know, the impossibility of making a decision. If you look at it as a risk-based situation, then uh, the evidence that climate change is a serious issue is far greater, far heavier than the sorts of decisions that business people and governments make every day of their lives um, because you never have sufficient information to be absolutely sure. You have to use your judgment. You have to take a risk-based approach. So risk is the key.